Good morning, and welcome to Bridgewater Church Online. Thanks for spending some screen time with us. You are joining us during our fall teaching series, Come Back, where we will be diving into the book of Acts together. As we begin, we invite you to participate with us for worship in whatever space you are in. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new season that we're entering into. God, we ask that you would show us what it looks like to make a comeback with you. Thank you for what you're teaching us through your word. Be with Pastor this morning as he shares. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It is fantastic to be together this morning and to be able to share together from God's Word in a brand new series called Comeback. Now, when I think about the word comeback, I'm energized. Let me actually give you the definition. The definition of comeback is to return to life, to regain a favorable position, or to recover from a deficit. Let's just do it again. 
come back means to return to life, to regain a favorable position, or to recover from a deficit. I have one simple question. Do any of you think we need a comeback? I mean, when I look at this definition, I think, wow, after everything we've been through in the pandemic, we need a return to life. When I think about the regain to a favorable position, I'm just ready to move on, aren't you? And then, what about the deficits that we felt on so many levels? What a perfect message and series that we're beginning today to talk about a comeback because we all need them in our lives. Now, I'm a history buff. Maybe you'd call me a history nut. But there are three politicians, I'm going to actually call them leaders, that you've maybe heard of, but you don't realize the impact that their lives have had on all of us even today. Think about this. Ulysses S. Grant was a successful uh, soldier, but he quit the army at age 32. He failed as a private businessman, and then he finally rejoined the Union Army during the Civil War. It was in 1862 that Lincoln placed Grant in charge of the Northern Union Army, and he led the entire Civil War for the president and for the United States to victory. And then, of course, you know this, Grant became president, adding another comeback chapter to his story. What about the famous Grover Cleveland? Now, I know you're thinking, Pastor, how, how has he impacted us? But did you know this? Grover Cleveland did the unthinkable. He's the only person to win two non-consecutive terms as the 22nd and the 24th president of the United States. And then what about Winston Churchill? He was forced to resign political office at the age of 40, and he said, are you ready? He said, I am finished. Hmm. Then he plotted his comeback, and in 1940, he became the Prime Minister of England and led the country and the world to a victory in World War II. Now, when I look at historical figures like this, and there's so many more of them, but when I look at figures like this, I think, wow, if they needed a comeback, don't we? It's incredible how we can get ourselves all in a in in just kind of a can I call it a snit? We get in this place where we are uh, unsettled and disgruntled, and yet all the time God is saying to us, no matter where you find yourself today, God has a comeback for you personally. He has a comeback for our country, our world, and more than ever, we need a comeback in God's church and his ministry in the kingdom. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a sneak peek uh, today. This is kind of like the preview to the new series that we want to launch next Sunday. And by the way, I just want to ask all of you to join us, whether it's online or it's in the house at 9.30 and 11, it is really time for us to have a comeback. And we're going to follow Jesus' disciples as they began this new ministry that formed the early church in the book of Acts. And today's sneak peek begins in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to tackle verses 36 through 37. And as we do, I want you to listen carefully to the three signals, three essential signals that God wants to give us to tell us we're ready for a comeback. Let's jump in. 
Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? I, you may be a little bit confused, so let's make sure we're all on the same page. Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. And so they had gathered together for prayer, and then one day in the upper room, there were 120 that had gathered together. And as they were praying, God gave them the Holy Spirit's power. If we had read just a little bit before this passage, a few verses earlier, we would have seen how the Holy Spirit fell like tongues of fire. Now, what, what was the importance of it? Just simply this. The minute that they were filled with God's Spirit, all of those people went out into the streets and began to share in unknown languages to themselves, but to known languages because there was such an eclectic gathering of people from all nations. And they began to hear in their own tongue, in their own language, the message of Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection. Then, unexpectedly, this burly fisherman named Peter got up. I don't know what he stood on. I don't know where he was. But he got up in front of a large crowd, and he began, get this, can you imagine this? He began to quote from the prophet Joel. And he showed how a, an ancient Hebrew prophecy had been fulfilled. And as he shared the message, finally, he says in verse 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, we're told in this passage that when they heard this, the people were cut to the heart. The word translated cut literally means to prick or to pierce thoroughly. Now, the minute that I thought of that, the minute that I read that from the Hebrew, my mind went racing back when I was a young dad. And we were living in a house with a finished basement. And there was something that I needed in the basement, and I flew down the stairs. As I flew down the stairs, I grabbed the rail, and unexpectedly, a piece of the rail about three inches broke off, and it went right through my hand. I didn't feel it at first, but once I got upstairs and showed it to Kay, my wife, she looked at me and she goes, that's bad. And then she goes, what are we going to do? And I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I called a, a neighbor who was a nurse. He came over. He looked at it and he goes, well, that's bad. And I, and I go, well, what can we do? You don't want to hear these words. I really don't know. He, Seriously, I'm not kidding. He goes, I don't know what we do. He left and Kay goes, are you going to go to the emergency room? I said, no. I'm going to man up, and I pulled it back through my hand. Wow. What an experience, and what a, are you ready for this? A piercing. In fact, what was odd, I went back down later that week to find where it had broken off. That entire rail was smooth everywhere. I never found it. Think about it like this. That day on Pentecost Day, when the people heard the message that Peter preached about Jesus, they were pierced, they were cut, they were pricked to the heart in such a way it was thorough, it was deep, it was to the core. And they said to him, what, what do we do? Brothers, apostles. Jesus' followers, 
What do we do? Now, this is what I think is exciting. It was time for a beautiful message to become a personal story of life transformation. And it leads to our first insight. How do we know when it's time for a comeback? It's time for a comeback when we hear the truth. Now, we've all faced this problem. Which of us have ever heard the truth, knew it was the truth, didn't like the truth, didn't want to listen to the truth, and decided to ignore the truth? You can relate. I can relate. There's been times we've all heard truth, and we just didn't like it. We go find other friends to help us feel better about ourselves. We, we, we stick our heads in Netflix. We want to just ignore it. We go find ice cream or M&Ms to drown our sorrows. But the bottom line is, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He didn't say, if you ignore the truth, then it'll all be okay. Somehow we get confused about what matters most in life. We get distracted by things that have no real value. But if we want to experience a comeback, if we want to have new energy, now listen, even in, especially in, the midst of our current struggles, if we want to come back, we have to be willing to hear the truth. And that's why I paired it with this word. The word is launch. Will you just say that with me? Launch. Kay and I, our first ministry, our first place to live after marriage, our, our incredible beginning of our journey was in Orlando, Florida. And I'll never forget, we were in bed early, early, early on a Saturday morning. There was a crash boom that literally jolted us out of bed. I thought somebody had actually hit our garage door and drove through the garage with their car. That's how loud it was. I raced out of the house. It was a beautiful, sunny morning. And then I realized what had happened. Some 50 miles away at Cape Canaveral, the space shuttle had launched and broken the sound barrier. Now listen, I want you to hear me. This is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. People heard the truth of the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. For those who were listening, the truth jettisoned them out of a deep spiritual sleep. They were ready to launch and discover that the truth of Jesus really can set us free. So how do we know when it's time for a comeback? We know it's time when we hear the truth and we're ready to embrace it, accept it, and we're ready to launch. That brings us to Acts 2, 38 through 41. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Here's our next insight. It's time for a comeback when we say yes to God. It is time for our comeback when we say yes to God. See, it's not enough just to know what the truth is. We have to be willing to say yes to God's truth. Now, think about it. Peter was preaching, and they asked him, what do we do now, brothers? He was very simplistic in his answer. He said, you must repent of your sins and submit to baptism in the name of Jesus. And in that moment, God would forgive. Isn't that a beautiful thing to understand? The moment that we ask Jesus to forgive us for our sins and we acknowledge that there is a Savior and we need that Savior, the moment that happens, God forgives us. It's incredible. 
Now, I actually want to break this down for us, though. First, he said we need to repent and turn from our sins. True repentance leads to a change of heart. Is it all right if we call it a U-turn? We need to move away from where we are to where God wants us to be. God sent the only Savior, Jesus Christ, who could deliver us from ourselves. Now just stop a minute. If you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, don't ever take for granted that only Jesus can save us from our sins. There is a God. We do sin, and our sin, whatever it is, separates us from God. And we have to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And I want to say this to you listening today. If you've never intentionally asked Jesus to be your Savior, or you have, and you've drifted away, he's always willing to welcome us with open arms. There isn't any sin we've committed that God won't forgive us if we humble ourselves and repent and turn away. But we have to believe by faith that Jesus is the Messiah. Pastor Tim Keller gave this incredible insight. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Now, it doesn't get any more simplistic than that, folks. In fact, I want you to grab this. 2,000 plus years later, we're still talking about Jesus. Most historical events are forgotten if that's all they are. But if it's real, and Jesus died for our sins, rose from the grave, and he's alive, Pastor Keller is right. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. If it's true, we need to embrace that truth by faith. That's the next step, baptism. The next step that Peter said is, you need to be immersed in water. Now, I want to be clear, baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward transformation. But why, why did Peter put it together? Repent. Ask Jesus to save you. Why, why did he say repent and then be baptized all in the same sentence? He did it because of this fact. Baptism in, requires us to be humble in God's presence. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John. We need to follow the steps of Jesus. And the word in, in Greek for baptized means to immerse. We're immersed demonstrating our commitment to Christ and, get this, the commitment to one another in the body of Christ, the church. But there was something more. The baptism Peter spoke of included a fresh inward power of the Holy Spirit. We can never begin to understand how incredible it is to walk in faith, ask Jesus to be our Savior, repent of our sins, and then say, I want to be baptized and commit not to a tradition, but to a transformation of God's power. I loved it. There was a young man just weeks ago. He walked into my office on a Sunday after church, and he looked at me and he said, Pastor, and I'm not kidding you, this is how it started. He looks at me and he goes, Pastor, I have to be baptized. I thought, that is refreshing. I said, have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? He goes, a, a few weeks ago, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I asked him to, to, to completely change and transform me. And then he went through a list of, of how Jesus had been transforming him. And he says, Pastor, I have to be baptized. And I had the privilege just a few weeks ago of baptizing this young man and to celebrate with him. I want you to hear me. The enemy of our soul is trying to rob us of joy 
He's trying to rob us of peace. He's trying to rob us of everything in this pandemic. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ is alive. We are in God's presence. And if by faith we will repent, and if by faith we are willing to walk in obedience, which includes baptism, there is an empowerment of God's Spirit that only God can give. And you know what, you know what the good news is? He wants to give it. How do we know when it's time for a comeback? Say yes to God. Where are you in your walk with God right now? Are you struggling through things? Have you just gotten lazy about your, your commitment to Christ? Have you decided that just kind of, you know, Tuning into a message is just enough and you're not really going deep with God? Have you just let your prayer life go? Or maybe you found your way to this message today and you're like, my life is a mess. I, 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 I want to believe there's a God. I'm telling you right now today, there is a power from God through Jesus Christ that we can all have if we put our faith and our trust in him. And that's why, that's why this story is so incredible. We're told that Peter, with more words, began to plead. He began to plead even more. Now, I love this, because I think, you know, pastors know, this is the first message ever preached, is this one by Peter. And I want you to know, it wasn't 20 minutes long. He, he spoke he spoke again, he pleaded with them, and that day more than 3,000 people repented and came to know Jesus as their Savior and were baptized. And you know what? I'm sad that they didn't count women in that culture, but can you imagine? It wasn't just 3,000. It must have been 6,000, 9,000. What an incredible day. It's time for a comeback when we say yes to God by faith. But there's one more thing. So let's look at this passage. Beginning in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I love this part. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's our third insight. It's time for a comeback when we unite together. It's time for a comeback when we unite together. Now, I don't have time to break all of this down, but I do want you to see clearly what happened in the formation of the early church in Acts. Luke, our author, paints a picture of a powerful faith community and four characteristics stand out. There was authentic teaching. This was teaching from the apostles who had walked directly with Jesus. Never underestimate that we need biblical teaching and biblical preaching in our lives. Too many times, too many churches are watering down Scripture as if the Word of God should simply be inspirational, motivational content. It is not. The Word of God is life-changing. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts through bone and marrow, through all of us spiritually, and there is nothing like the authentic teaching of God's Word. And then as they all gathered in God's presence and then began to go out and share their stories, awe and wonder followed. There were miracles. Lives were changed. People were saved. People repented. It, it was an incredible time, and the church needs that kind of power again today. There was agreeable accord. They were united together. They, they understood how to get things done, because think about it. 
The church was thousands of people. They had to organize. They had to share. They shared everything in common. They helped one another. They weren't greedy. They were full of love and commitment. And then they had attractive attitudes. Think about it. We're told that beyond a shadow of a doubt, people noticed, they heard the story again and again, and God kept adding to their numbers daily. In fact, I want to just make sure I say this. It is essential that we in the church today commit to authentic biblical teaching. We expect and believe in awe and wonderful miracles to happen, that we have agreement together and we keep our eyes focused on Jesus and not on our likes and our dislikes, and that we have attractive attitudes that will attract other people into God's kingdom and into God's church. And I realize more than ever, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, I realize that there is a real struggle among especially younger people today about what is the church and, and, and who is God. And I want to say this, the church is not perfect. We're not perfect people. This, this preacher that's preaching this message, please understand, I'm not perfect. I'm a man who has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I want you to know I serve a perfect God of love and grace. I believe in a Savior who can transform our lives. And by the way, too, I, I want to add this. That's why we encourage all of you to get into one of our small groups, one of our life groups, online or in person. And if you're catching this message and you go to another church, get involved in a small group in your ministry because we have to do life together. Listen, folks. If we can do restaurants together and we can do sports together and we can do concerts together and movies together, we can do life together in the body of Christ. And we need that. I was really moved by a story that I, I doubt you've heard. I, I doubt you've ever heard about Jeremiah Landfear. Does that name ring a bell? It was the mid-1800s, and he lived in New York City. It was a time of economic depression. There was a stock market crash. Political division over the issue of slavery. And they had just entered into a time of war. Lanfear's church was located in the north corner of Fulton and William Streets in New York. He was a businessman, but he had a heart for God's kingdom. He began to knock on doors trying to share the gospel, but it made little difference talking about Jesus. Eventually, he realized there was a need for prayer in New York City. By the way, do you think there's a need for prayer today? He began distributing thousands of flyers advertising a prayer meeting at a church on Fulton Street to be held on September 23rd, 1857. The first half hour, no one came. Then five people came, and they prayed together for a few more minutes. But in a matter of weeks, Jeremiah Lanfear would not give up. And in a matter of weeks, all of a sudden, there were prayer meetings all throughout New York City. Get this. More than 10,000 people across New York and the United States heard about it, and they began to pray every day. Within weeks, 10,000 people per week were accepting Jesus as their Savior. And within months... This led to an American revival that spread to Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, Europe, Africa, India, Australia, and the Pacific Islands, all because one man knew it was time for a comeback. And prayer was the key 
that unlock the door. A.W. Tozer, a wonderful pastor, once said, God always works where his people meet his conditions. But only when and as they do, any spiritual visitation will be limited or extensive depending on how well and how widely the conditions are met. The first condition is oneness of mind among the persons who are seeking the visitation. Do you know what I call that? Momentum. That's momentum. That's what a comeback needs. A comeback needs the truth. It needs the willingness to launch by faith and say yes to God. And then it needs the momentum of unity. And more than ever, we need that kind of momentum today. Would you do this with me? I'm just going to walk out here and I'm going to ask you to stand in your homes. Would you do that? Just stand in your homes and let's hold our hands out like we've done for so many months now. Just hold your hands out. And I want us to pray that we would have the willingness to launch and accept the truth, to have the faith to believe in the powerful message of Jesus Christ, and then to build unity and experience momentum that will change our church, our, our world, and will change our lives. Let's pray. God, we need to come back. We need to come back, God. We need to see you work in ways we cannot imagine or dream. We need to put our faith and trust in you. Jesus, forgive us for our sins. We repent. God, we need to repent. And it doesn't mean we'll be perfect. It just means that in humility, we recognize that we need your help. And God, I pray that we would put all of our faith and our trust in you. I pray, God, right now that you would hear this prayer and the prayer of your people and you would visit us with a comeback revival of lives that transform us from the inside out. God, let this be the most incredible season that we've experienced. And may we put all of our trust in you. By faith we launch and we believe that you will give us the momentum that we need. And we trust this prayer to you, Jesus. Amen. I love you so much. You're incredible. If you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, let us know online. Just say, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. If you give us contact information, we'll reach out. If you want to be baptized, tell us. But more than ever, just know this. You're not alone. We're in this together. I know we're still moving through, but it's time for a comeback. And we believe that God will give us that as we put our trust in him. I love you. And until we see each other again, take heart and be transformed. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song.
Hey Bridgewater Church family, my name is Liz and we are so glad that you've joined us for worship today. We're gearing up for fall around here and we hope that you and your family can be a part of all that is going on. So check out this week's Bridgewater Buzz. Life groups kick off this week and we have a spot for you. Whether you're looking for an online option, a group that provides childcare, or people in the same phase of life as you, we want to help you find the right fit. Begin to think now about what that looks like for you and feel free to reach out to Tracy at bwch.org if you have any questions. Signups are available now in the lobby and we just can't wait to do community with you. Ladies of BWC, it's picnic time. The Exhale Women's Ministry is hosting a breakfast picnic under a big tent in the front lawn this coming Saturday morning, September 18th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. This is going to be a sweet time of fellowship and food and hopefully sunshine, and we hope that you can join us. Please sign up in the lobby this morning or email k at bwch.org if you have any questions. It's mid-September. The pumpkin spice lattes are already flowing in abundance, and I, for one, am not mad about it. Fall is a great season around here, and it is just around the corner. We wanted to give you a few dates to get on your family's calendar right away, so check it out. During September, our kids are learning all about Nehemiah and talking about taking initiative. Bring the whole family at 11 a.m. for safe, fun, and Jesus-filled kids programming. Teen families, the race kicks back off next Sunday, September 19th at 6 o'clock p.m. This is one of the major highlights of our student year and you won't want to miss it. 
You can pre-register at bwch.org or when you arrive on the 19th. The registration is $5. And finally, we are launching into an exciting new series called Come Back During the Month of September. Next Sunday, September 19th, will be a great day to invite your friends to come and experience the comeback that God has in store for all of us. Be praying now about who God would have you reach out to with a personal invitation. Your comeback is now. Thanks for joining us for worship today. It's a great time to be a part of everything that God is doing in this community. And we hope to see you online and on campus as we continue to pursue God and all that he has in store for us in this season. We're so blessed to be a part of this Bridgewater family with each of you.